Okay, so this is a very quick overview of what we are going to be covering today. Um, first up will be understanding types of behavioral addictions and their impact. Um, secondly, we'll be looking at identifying some of these behavioral addictions. And last but not least, um, as a lot of you have mentioned uh, earlier on, is really uh, we're going to look at how to support someone who's struggling with addictions. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, so um, today, this is the few major behavioral addictions we're going to be talking about today. Um, okay, so I think before we even go further, I think just want to state that um, addictions, I think a lot of people would think about you know, alcohol, drugs and stuff like that, but that one is considered chemical addictions because there is uh, consuming of a substance. Yeah. And that will actually be covered uh, in the next session, next Monday. Yeah. So today we're going to focus uh, really on behavioral addictions and um, the few categories you can see here, shopping, uh, yeah, this one, I'm a little bit guilty of it, but disclaimer, I don't think I'm an addict, but we'll look later at what defines an addict, yeah. Uh, secondly, handphone and cyber addiction, um, which I think most of the time we're looking at the group of maybe uh, children and youth a bit more, but I think increasingly we are seeing that uh, maybe elderly and also adults are getting more addicted to handphone and cyber games, yeah. Um, next will be uh, gambling addiction and also sex addiction. Yep. So these are the few major things we're going to be um, covering today. Yeah. Hey, over to you to bring us through gambling addiction. Right. Uh, so just now when we were going through uh, the the uh, little bit of a check-in with everyone on what you are interested in, um, people have mentioned uh, wondering about gambling addiction, or alcohol addiction, as well as uh, uh, what was it, internet addiction. So alcohol is actually a chemical addiction, so we'll leave that for next week. Um, but for gambling addiction, right, uh, we will be going a little bit more in detail so you can understand a bit more about what gambling addictions is. So actually for gambling addiction, some of us immediately think about, um, you know, gambling at a casino, but actually uh, there are a physical casino, but actually there are many forms. Uh, so it can include for the total lotteries and for casinos, right, it's not just the physical casinos, it can also include online casinos, which means that it could be uh, local or foreign online casinos. Uh, and then of course, uh, sports and horse racing. Uh, and uh, also some people actually at gamble uh, within the stock market as well. So basically, when we talk about addiction, it means that um, this, this this behavior kind of takes the person uh, uh, to takes the person's attention away, uh, such that the person doesn't function, uh, can't function uh, normally within uh, his normal life, and uh, at the expense often is also at the expense of family relationships, work, things that they normally need to take responsibility for. Yeah, so uh, gambling addictions can take on these forms. And what is the hardest is that actually gambling disorder is sometimes referred to as a hidden illness because you cannot see uh, or, or see any physical signs or symptoms. Normally, they don't appear, you know, like ill or they don't have uh, the kind of physical withdrawal symptoms, but you do see them a lot uh, of being very... Um, very they, they need to, they need to uh, go back to the gambling behavior quite a fair bit, right? So um, how do you tell if... Is potent how do you tell the person is potentially a problem gambler? Okay, so these behaviors are uh, not exhaustive. Uh, so, and also if the person has this behavior, it doesn't also mean that the person is a gambling addict. Uh, like we say, we are not doing a diagnosis today, but these are some uh, signs and symptoms that a person may be a problem gambler. Um, perhaps, right, when they meet with uh, difficulties, they use gambling as a way to cope. Um, perhaps as a result of the gambling behavior, they start to miss school. Uh, they start to work in order to earn money in order to go to the gambling table. Uh, sometimes they will neglect uh, uh, relationships or they may face financial troubles because of gambling because in that case, they'll be borrowing in order to feed the behavior of uh, gambling. Uh, perhaps that sometimes uh, uh, the gambling takes on such a, a, a long drawn uh, period of time in their life. Sometimes they will just not go to work the next day because they're too tired, etc. So possibly at risk of losing the job. Um, and also they may be, they actually may say that uh, I'm, I don't have a gambling problem uh, and withdrawal, etc. So uh, these are some symptoms. Um, but of course, if you want to know whether you definitely uh, have an addiction difficulty or your family member have an addiction difficulty, definitely it's the most important to seek treatment, right? 
okay. So just want to share, stop this a little while and share with you a very short clips um, that we have um, from uh, Mark Lee. I don't know if you all uh, probably know about him. Uh, actually, he was also a uh, addict uh, at some point in time in his life and he was sharing uh, some parts of his story so it's a one minute 第四期, 輸掉自己, 我也因為生命中這兩個女人, 大家好, 很多人或許不知道, 我過去也是個爛賭鬼, 下足很大我也因为生命中这两个女人我不应该连自己也输掉。如果我输掉了自己，我这一生就白活。Okay, so this is actually a very short uh clips, and I'm kind of sharing this because uh there is actually a sinus cycle of gambling. So first of all, right, uh, when a person goes into a, a, a winning experience, so they first go into the gambling, uh, whether it's online or offline, etc., they experience a win. And then after that, they play frequently, and then they start to experience an uh, expectation of having a major win. And then the more they play, the more there's a loss. So basically, um, after the experience of win, then what happens is you will get into a frequent play and frequent loss, uh, and then um, then frequent loss will result in the person who is the addict facing starting to face financial difficulties so in several uh, if you go google on gambling right actually the, the after a while they just start um uh, um, playing bigger and bigger and then they start borrowing and because the belief is that they will eventually get back to the winning streak right so they start to do go into this session which mark lee has said is chasing losses believe that one person will actually be able to get back the winning streak and then uh, they will borrow or at some point they may borrow or commit the crimes in order to continue gambling, right? So this this cycle just keeps going on and on until um, they, they, they actually win again. And then when they win again, there is actually a euphoria again. And they may want to play again to expect more major wins. And then this whole cycle continues. So actually, right, the addictive behavior starts when there's a belief that uh, it gets, um, there's, a, there's a possibility of winning. And then uh, there's a chance that they may actually recruit back the loss or even earn, uh, win even more. So that's why it makes it very hard to get off this um, this habit for uh, some uh, ethic, ethics as well. Okay. okay, so what are some of the impact on the individual? So uh, the impact um, will be social isolation, uh, withdrawal to the obsession of winning it back. So uh, winning the money back. So at some point when they lose, they will feel that they need to get money. So in different uh, interviews that we have actually seen, right, uh, some people will steal from their families. They may use a credit card to take money, pawn jewelry, uh, or they may use other kinds of, uh, they may steal from the family as well, or you know, even kind of like uh, forcefully take the money or use the children's pocket money. Uh, so this is a situation where they're kind of getting obsessed about getting money in order to kind of bring back and get back into the winning streak. And uh, there's some risk-taking behaviors as I've shared before. Uh, and some of the risk-taking behavior may result in them getting into trouble with the law. Uh, so uh, perhaps if they steal and it's in public, then perhaps they get into trouble with the law. And this obsession with the winning of money back ends up uh, perhaps uh, keeps them at the um, gambling table for a long time. So they may call in sick, etc. may result in loss of employment. Uh, I think um, a lot of people actually mentioned that the partner is one of the people who will be actually uh, impacted the most in a situation of someone who is uh, has problem gambling. And uh, because as a result of stealing, taking money, you know, etc., uh, it fosters a lot of mistrust within the family. Uh, and also financial difficulties, addicts may actually use the money meant for household expenses to finance the habits of behavior. Uh, and especially in the situation of a spouse or maybe other people who are in the family, they may end up taking on more of the responsibilities at home. Um, so uh, in some, some of the families that we have actually met, um, uh, and also I think one of you also mentioned that there is a lot of um, 
sense of um uh like you don't know what to do anymore yeah and you feel very disappointed and 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 you want to help but you don't know how else you can do anymore so this impact can also be very psychologically draining on the family member as well right okay so this is actually um uh, an information about casino exclusion order which we thought might be kind of helpful for uh, you guys to actually if you are if you have family members or friends who are involved in uh, problem gambling so the first thing is actually uh, that uh, this is a casino exclusion order you can they can either self exclude or the family can exclude on their behalf uh, it's a minimum of one year um, if you are if if the person is actually a bankrupt or on a government financial aid there is an automatic exclusion by law yeah and then um, the person imposed with a visit limit uh, or exclusion orders must be Singaporean or PR uh, and if the person wants to revoke they may be required to participate in counseling rehabilitation or uh, some kind of assessment of whether the problem gambling still exists yeah so uh, there's a lot more information you can uh, find the information on National Council of Problem Gambling and they'll be able to advise you a bit more of what you need to do if your loved one is spending a lot of time at the uh, Singapore casinos okay uh, okay, so the next thing that I think a lot of you are also very concerned about is actually uh, computer and gaming addiction. And I think that uh, it is gaining a lot of popularity, like what Ting Ting said, is uh, among the young people. Uh, a lot of it comes from computer games, arcade machines, uh, and also uh, the, the, the new challenge is now that all of us have, a lot of us have handphones now. And a lot of these games, they are addictive, are actually embedded within the handphone. So in a way, it's very easy to assess. Like, you know, anytime the person has a downtime, they can pick up the phone and then start, you know, playing games within it. It's easy to get addicted because uh, the, the, the game algorithm is intended to for 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 you to keep wanting to play uh, and also if people go on to social networking sites like facebook etc sometimes you can see links that bring you into games so this is also another way that people get access to initial uh, gaming as well uh, but what i also want to um, uh, uh, kind of like uh, emphasize is also actually uh, one of the most common kind of uh, gaming is it actually right inter uh, incorporates all our um, basic human needs into the game itself. So they call it the multiplayer gaming universe or massive multiplayer online role playing game. Lah. And basically what this does is that why it's so addictive is because it's not just the person playing with the computer, but the person is playing live with a lot of people from all over the world. Yeah, so in some ways they are playing against a human being. So it's like a game, uh, a physical game. But then the other thing is also they also chit chat on the sidelines. So it's also social. Yeah, then it's also competitive and then you have to do it during real time. So let's say the person is coming on to play, right? You have to go on to the same time to play, meaning that uh, what is harder to dictate the time that they can go online. Meaning, let's say uh, if uh, normally if the child goes online um, at 8 o'clock and then finishes at 9. But if their friends is playing at like, you know, USA 10 a.m., they might want to go online at 10 p.m. In Singapore so uh, this is why it gets addictive because there are multiple elements of a human needs embedded within this gaming and I think as parents or friends if we want to understand uh, um, why it's so hard to get off uh, gaming especially it's important to think about why it's addictive in the first place so that we can also kind of understand their world and what are some of the things that they are getting through this online uh, gaming world as well okay so uh, next we are going into the symptoms so usually for people who are kind of addicted to games not that they are an addict uh, but that they may be more uh, showing certain symptoms they may lose a sense of time because a lot of the games are very addictive so they go through different levels so they want to keep on achieving that so-called high because they will get a reward so that is when they get this sense of euphoria uh, and as a loss as a result of that sometimes they will avoid doing work because they want to get to the next level and then the brain will trigger a kind of reward system like wow i win something and i'm doing so i achieve something uh, so as a result some of them have difficulties keeping uh, schedules and if you are trying to say hey you are spending too much time on the games they may get very defensive um, but yeah at the same time they may also feel a lot of guilt because they cannot stop as well especially if it's a multiplayer game where they really want to get online and win their friends so sometimes they may end up uh, uh, being dishonest about it um, and uh, um, maybe saying i'm not online i'm not playing a game but actually they are doing that uh, a lot of them actually feel a sense of isolation uh, with the social world around them okay okay so um what are the harmful effects 
So one of the interesting harmful effects is actually uh, light induced uh, seizures uh, and there's musculoskeletal uh, disorders of the upper arm. So because they spend so much time at the computer, um, sometimes the, the light that reflects out can get very overwhelming. A uh, small percentage of people actually get seizures from it. And then muscular pain will mean like the arms, the hands, the legs, uh, the arms, the hands and the, uh, the shoulders will get some pain. Uh, increased aggressive thoughts and behaviors because uh, the games actually induce a kind of neurological um, um, impact on the brain. Uh, and then in actual social interactions, they may be present themselves as not being very cooperative, more socially isolated. Some of them actually end up not wanting to go to school. Um, often tired because they're spending extensive time in front of a computer as well as stress. And they also have some poorer impulsive control. So when we talk about impulsive control, we mean um, like emotions and behaviors that uh, are uncontrollable by the person, but actually also cause behavior conflicts with other people. That means their poor impulse resulted in the uh, difficult relationships with other people. So that also triggers back to the fact that maybe they don't have a lot of friends eventually, then they are more socially isolated. Uh, yeah, so actually these are the two major kind of addictions that people will face. So what Tintin will be doing is to identify what are some of the ways uh, of understanding the addictions and then what are some ways that we can actually uh, support uh, the person who is addicted or if the person is addicted, what can they do about it? Okay, um, so um, this portion, I'm just going to be sharing with you about some of the factors that uh, contribute to the behavioral addictions that we have been talking about so far. Um, so first up, uh, intrapersonal factors. Um, so first thing we see with the uh, mental health problems. Um, so one example that I can think of is um, for someone who maybe has a mood disorder or can't quite regulate their emotions very well, then um, maybe going shopping, or going gambling or uh, any of, of these um, can help to uh, lower the person's anxiety and help the person to cope better. Um, I think recently we, we do hear quite a, this, this term of uh, retail therapy, yeah, so that's shopping. Um, I think, okay, uh, maybe I, for myself, <laughs> yeah, it's a little disclosure here that, um, I mean, shopping is a means for me as well, personally, to manage my work stress. Yeah, so that could be uh, something that a lot of people are doing, um, especially uh, at this time when um, online shopping is so convenient, you don't even have to, you know, leave your house, you don't even have to leave your sofa, yeah. Staying at home, sitting there, you can just click and buy anything you want. Yeah. So um, as, as, as people do this more often, I think if we are not careful in uh, regulating and managing ourselves and checking our bills regularly, maybe, uh, then it, it can become an addiction uh, slowly. Yeah. Um, and then the next thing, underlying anxieties uh, and also esteem issues and confidence issues. Um, I think uh, probably some of us might be a bit more familiar with this. So, in fact, gaming and cyber addiction, it can be a means to help uh, maybe a young person or maybe children feel more confident about themselves, yeah. Um, I mean, especially for um, students who do not do well academically, so they really don't feel so good about themselves. But if they can go, on, can go, on, can go online and then uh, get like the highest score, break records and stuff. So um, I think that actually is very helpful to making them feel better about themselves. I mean, as unhealthy as it might sound to us, yeah. Um, I think the other thing is also like, uh, some Pei was introducing some of the games uh, earlier on. So um, in fact, like, you know how uh, role-playing games are all, you can actually form your own identity, you know, be whatever you want. So I think this uh, also maybe gives some children and young persons, or in fact adults, or in fact anybody, um, this freedom to uh, really be what they want to be. You know, sometimes in real life, it might not, we might not be able to um, you know, be the person that we want, this confident, pretty, outspoken, vocal person. Yeah. So when you go online and then you, you engage in all these games, you talk to people. So um, yeah, I think the, the effect is that it can make someone feel very good about themselves. Yeah and be the ideal self that they can't do in real life. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And something that's related also is um, interpersonal factors like poor social skills. So, I mean, we can imagine someone who finds it hard to interact with people uh, face to face or finds it hard to um, open conversations with people. So, uh, in fact, online then would be a good way to still interact with people. Yeah. Uh, but it's just that, again, I think the what we want to emphasize here is that if you're not careful here, then as it goes on for a long period of time, and you find that you cannot draw yourself away from it, then it becomes an addiction. Yep. 
Um, next, uh, we're we'll talking about uh, you know mass media and cultural factors. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know now we have um, social media, we have Facebook and Instagram, we have all sorts of things uh, easily accessible. So that in fact I think promotes a culture of um, people like um, very easily they can get access to you know online you know be, to be online and also to interact and, and do whatever they want online basically yeah. So technically, uh, yes, there are laws governing that, but um, in a way, I think a lot of people take to online to really just do whatever that they want to. Probably, they, like what I said earlier, they can't do it in real life. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And also, I, I, I think you all have realized this also. When you all go to Instagram, Facebook, or even when you just go online to surf the net to look for things, um, advertisement, advertisements start popping up. You know, they tell you oh, what's trending, what's nice, and all. Yeah. And it really doesn't help that. Um, across all ages, I, yeah, I really think it's across all ages, um, that it, it, it kind of makes people want to compete with one another. Yeah, no matter whether is it to be like the happiest person to, uh, to um, like be the most uh, fashionable, be the most stylish and etc. cetera, and all to uh, maybe have the highest online gaming score and all that. Yeah, so all these in fact uh, make people want to compete and slowly, slowly people do get more hooked onto uh, online and even social media, uh, for instance, yeah. Um, yeah. So another thing that um, family culture, so I think one classic example would be this. Um, for those of us out here who celebrate Chinese New Year, <laughs> I think you would know what we do often when we go visiting during Chinese New Year, right? Yeah, uh, Pakya also means to gamble, yeah. So while we, uh, I think a lot of us, well, well, most people, I would say most people are able to uh, manage quite well and say, oh, you know, it's just a, um, just a celebration thing. You know, we get together, we gamble, we have fun a little bit. Sometimes we put in a bit of money, sometimes we don't. Yeah, but um, I wonder that how that also gives uh, maybe the children and young people in the family the, the idea that, oh, you know, so gambling is actually quite okay or not too bad. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that's something that uh, gets uh, into their heads from, from a very young age. Yeah. Um, last but not least, I think um, unemployment and poverty. I think unemployment is, is, is a very big issue at this current moment. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when someone faces unemployment or, or maybe even poverty, may or may not, but um, these, these are situations that make people very down and uh, very stressed out, a lot, a, a lot of anxiety. So, um, they can take the online games or even, uh, okay, maybe not gambling, but maybe online games and um, all these uh, social media and stuff. And then if they're not careful again, uh, they might get addicted. Yeah. Uh, Play next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so just to go a little bit into uh, some of the factors that can lead to behavioral addictions, um, past traumatic experiences. Um, for instance, if someone uh, is exposed to maybe like um, abuse or something, or maybe an accident that, that really traumatized the person very much and the person just cannot get out of that experience, um, addiction might become a way to cope with the uh, trauma. Yeah. Um, and also, when we look at um, developmental stages uh, of, of people, um, I think I give an example. Uh. So um, when it comes to uh, children and young persons, right? So at this age, they are looking for uh, friends, they are looking for a sense of achievement, uh, they don't want to lose out to their peers and all. So um, nowadays in the current uh, setting and the current society we're in, um, when it comes to catching up, uh, I think a lot has to be done online. Yeah, No matter whether it's um, um, like finding out what's the most trending thing, uh, what's the latest new song that people are listening to, and yeah, or what's the latest meme that people are talking about. Yeah, yeah. So these are very real things that um, teenagers uh, or maybe children also do feel the need to catch up. Yeah. Um, I, I left out a point earlier. So um, I think what we are trying to say uh, when we talk about all these factors is that um, this addictive behavior really meets the needs of the individual. I think a lot of times when we say, uh, when we talk about addictions, I think the first reaction that people have is, why is, why is that so? Why does the person get addicted to something? Yeah, but that's, that's, a, that's a very natural reaction to have. But I think what we want to, uh, what we want to highlight today is that uh, we hope that everyone can, um, you know, leave this forum and then have a better understanding that, oh, okay, um, this addiction does meet a certain need for the person. Yeah, no matter whether it's a healthy, okay, okay, sorry, it's, it's probably not a very healthy way, but um, it, it does meet a need for the person and hence the person continues to engage in this behavior. Yeah. 
Um, okay, just very quickly. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think advancement of technology, like I said earlier, now you can just sit at home. You don't even need to step out. You can get access to online very easily. You can get access to gambling very easily. Last time you just need to go to gambling then, but now no need already. Yeah. Um, changes in lifestyle. Uh, I think the recent COVID, or rather not recent, still ongoing, but now that we're in phase two. Yeah. But I think earlier on during the circuit breaker period when we couldn't really go out at home, uh, it was a lot of uh, boredom that everyone was dealing with. So when we are bored, what do we do? We go online. <laughs> yeah, no matter whether it's to surf net, to gamble, to buy things and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, changes in lifestyle can affect uh, how we cope. And if we're not careful again, then it can lead to addiction. Yeah. Uh, okay, last but not least, um, we said earlier that addiction can be a way to uh, manage and cope with some of the stresses that we are dealing with. So uh, imagine if someone is dealing with family conflict, um, can't quite manage family relations very well. So maybe uh, um, like I heard a young person who uh, connects very well with online. So I mean the parents perceive that he is really addicted to uh, gaming. Uh, but I think the other side of the situation is that um, he really cannot connect with his family members. So what he does is he connects online with people. Yeah. But that I think slowly as he connects more with the online, uh, I think the problem is that he, he can't quite withdraw himself from it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so here we are looking at some of the impact of the behavioral addictions we have been talking about. Um, I think physical pay has highlighted earlier. So you know, for someone who uh, games until you don't eat, don't sleep and stuff, then I think you can imagine what, what happens to the person's physical health. Um, the next would be psychological and emotional. Um, yeah, like I said earlier, I think uh, a lot of times when we hear the word addiction, we, we, our reaction is naturally like how we frown, like oh, 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 why like that, you know, why, why did this person do this? Um, but I think what we also want to share today is that for the person who is addicted, um, there are often a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions. So uh, it can be things like feeling a lot of guilt, uh, shame, and uh, a lot of fear, in fact. Fear because they, they know that they can't get themselves out of it. Yeah, it can be a pretty scary thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then criminal offenses, like Pei also mentioned. Um, if, I mean, for instance, someone owes debts or um, yeah, a lot of uh, in the, in the, I think owing money to loan sharks and all that. So, uh, it, so and then they resort to stealing or, or doing things like that to get money to pay back the money to pay back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The next thing would be um, domestic violence. So, I think when someone in the family uh, does unfortunately get addicted to something, uh, in this case, okay, let's say it's a behavior addiction, uh, it can create a lot of conflict and a lot of um, fear and a lot of uh, arguments in the family. So, when the arguments and all that escalates, uh, it's not hard to imagine that it can lead to violence in the family. Yeah. Um, school issues, um, when we, like for instance, we talk about children and young people, um, they game or they surf net, they use Facebook and stuff until uh, late at night. Um, and then the next day they go to school, they can't concentrate, they fall asleep. Yeah. And I think of course the additional thing about um, being very engaged in online gaming is that maybe slowly they also uh, forget how to interact with real people. <laughs> yeah. So that can also affect uh, their social relationships in school. Um, yeah, last but not least, I think family relationships, like I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, if there is a lot of conflict and a lot of arguments going on, uh, definitely relationships are affected. And also, um, for instance, if someone is very engaged on uh, or being addicted to something, like um, like maybe to shopping or to um, gaming or like even online gambling and stuff, or yeah, um, then there is, I, I would imagine that then there is definitely withdrawal from the family. Yeah, withdrawal is not just because of the addiction, but also because um, cannot really uh, resolve this issue of the addiction. Yeah, so then the person might get even more withdrawn and go further into the addiction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, these are some very quick identifying behave. Uh, some of the quick identifying things that we look for when we talk about addictions. Uh, but I think what like what Pei mentioned, uh, we are not really saying that you know if the person has this or we are not diagnosing the person with addictions. No. But it's really helping us to uh, keep a lookout if uh, maybe someone in the family or someone you know uh, may be uh, having some of these uh, symptoms. Yeah. So first thing would be impact on functioning and relationships. So like I mentioned earlier, um, if the person starts to withdraw from family, doesn't want to 
um, you know, go out with them anymore, doesn't want to interact with them anymore. Uh, the moment the, the behavior, like for instance, the constantly on the computer or the handphone is mentioned, uh, the person gets angry. Yeah, and these are uh, quite telltale signs. Yeah, but I think the very one big thing they are looking at is impact on functioning. So um, if the person cannot even um, continue with their daily routine, uh, cannot, for instance, for children and youth, they cannot go to school anymore. For adults, they cannot go to work anymore. Uh, maybe for elderly person, they, they can't uh, go about their normal routine, go out and meet friends and stuff. So um, these are all telltale signs that the person might be addicted to a certain behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also persistence of engaging in this behavior. So I think one example that I've ever heard was this. Um, I think this person was addicted to, I think maybe like a, I can't remember what it was, but the person really went out of the way just to get that thing. Just cannot deal with the withdrawal, like cannot cope with not having the thing. Uh, forgot whether it was like a, a, a bag or something or buying something or what. Yeah, but just um, if the person is really persistent on um, getting something and not being uh, like cannot like cannot take it when you say oh no 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 you can't you can't touch it then that's also another sign that we are looking for. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now we move on to supporting the person who is addicted. Um, I think first is really being present and two, attending to emotions. Okay, I know you all might be thinking, that's so difficult. Uh, yes, we do recognize that um, it is definitely very, very challenging. Um, this whole journey of uh, recovery from addiction is a very, very long journey, yeah. Um, but as I said, because a lot of times when we come to know like someone is addicted to something, uh, and, this, and in this case, it is someone who is very close to us, the first reaction would definitely be anger. <laughs> and there'll be no arguments and stuff. Um, but here's where it can, um, you know, you could, you could uh, say maybe attending to the emotions, like the fear, the shame and the guilt that we, that we were talking about earlier. So that can in fact help to turn the, the conversation a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and I think the third thing is also being uh, very aware of possible triggers. Uh, for instance, um, does the home environment present any particular trigger? Is there any particular item that might make the person uh, think of the addiction again? Uh, or is there any like family relationships that need to be worked on such that um, if the relationship continues to uh, deteriorate, can it also make the person go back to addiction again? Yeah. Um, last but not least, uh, it's also important to have uh, you know encouragement, some rewards or you know, some praises. Say, oh, you know, you did a good job today. I see that you have um, taken the effort to uh, do something else, to keep yourself busy. I see that you have taken effort to you know, walk the long way to avoid the total stand, yeah, stuff like that. So I think it's uh, also helpful to give this kind of encouragement. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, okay, to continue on, um, lifestyle changes. So um, I think what we want to highlight here is this, because for someone who is addic addicted to a particular behavior uh, for the purpose of today's session, um, as we said earlier, there, there is a need, as in the addiction does meet a need. So um, we, it will be important to find out actually what is the need that this addiction is meeting. Yeah. And then uh, from there, then um, changes have to be made to, to, to the person's lives, like, definitely. And also I think the family's lives um, to really change and uh, try to minimize the, the trigger to the, um, as, as much as possible. Yeah. If, for instance, the person uh, always you know, lies around, doesn't do anything, uh, starts to feel bored, and then uh, starts to go shopping again. Yeah. So maybe um, then what the family or what the uh, uh, next of kin could do is really just to make sure that the person is meaningfully engaged in something that he or she likes and all. Yeah. So just an example. Yeah. Um, yes, monitoring usage. I think this is uh, critical when it comes to uh, handphone and uh, internet addiction. Yeah. Um, we, we often hear this from parents, they say, uh, but I asked him to stop, he don't want to stop, he keep playing. I tell him put away the phone, he don't want. Yeah. Uh, it's, again, I, I think I want to uh, assure everyone uh, today that it's, it's, it's very real, it's a very real issue. Um, but I think um, there are some ways that we could still kind of go about monitoring the usage. So one way would be having the laptop, for instance, in a living room. Uh, well, I think the idea is not that you, you just stand behind him staring at what he's doing. No, not quite that also. Uh, but it's really just, you know, you walk past, you roughly have some idea of what uh, your child might be doing on the laptop. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, and I think another thing that is very important we want to highlight is this. Um, I know that the addiction uh, is not healthy, it's not helpful. And a lot of times the first thought uh, everyone would have is to let's just remove the addiction altogether. Yeah, but I think that would actually would be quite a dangerous thing to do um, because it meets a need for the person, right? And then imagine you just take away the whole thing and then what's the person going to do? Yeah, yeah. So, so we would say uh, it's really helping the person to uh, slowly, slowly reduce the reduce the uh, usage or reduce the you know the behavior and stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, monitoring behavioral symptoms. I think uh, this would be referring to like um, you say um, someone uh, has addiction and uh, it's actually more of a coping strategy. So then uh, it will be helpful for the family or per the person's close to this person to say that, okay, um, what are some of the signs that show that this person is in stress? Yeah. So if this person is in stress, then do we, uh, what, what do we need to do now to make sure that it doesn't go to the level that you know, the person starts to engage in the addiction behavior? Yeah. Uh, okay, last but not least, uh, exclusion order. So this is what Tay has mentioned earlier. To, uh, these are some of the uh, exclusion order will be one of the more practical ways like, to um, really just uh, reduce the addiction or just take away the addiction. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now we come to this communication part again. Let's let us say that we, we really know that this is very challenging. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think we, we could discuss uh, more later during the training segment. Uh, okay. But I think here we want to just um, introduce this part about really because um, I'm sure I, I thought I saw somewhere that you know uh, this anger from the person or something I don't know whether I saw wrongly yeah um, if, if the question is whether um, how do you communicate with someone who's angry whenever you bring up the addiction um, I think this is this is something that we, we hope that uh, would be helpful um, when you say communicating uh, we, we try to reframe, okay, again, I know this is very challenging, but uh, we refrain from really just jumping at the person and just being angry and scold, 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 yeah. Because that, that probably would not bring the conversation um, much further. Yeah, it, it might make the person withdraw further, yeah. So I think we would want to say that, you know, maybe we use this as a framework to say uh, we give our full undivided attention to the person, but this is just the start. So this is being present. Um, why we use this word, I think those of us who know Mandarin will know that this is to me, this, this means to listen uh, in Mandarin. Yeah, think, yes. So um, why we say that this would be helpful is really, uh, if you look at the, how the, what, what makes up the whole word, right? Is the ear, the eyes, undivided attention, and the heart. Yeah. So I think what is important here is we really, um, you know, listen with the heart. Sometimes we listen, we just, oh, okay, but actually inside, you know, just want to say what you think. But yeah, I suppose, yes, you can still communicate what you want to say, uh, but it's, I think, holding that down a little bit. Yeah, and then just listening to the other person, find out what is the struggle that the person is having. Yeah, and then I think it would be, then be easier to deal with the addiction later on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think we we would like to also give um, or rather suggest some helpful questions that um, uh, would be good. Be we think uh, when you want to communicate with someone who on, on such a difficult topic. Yeah. Um, so first 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 question would be uh, what can I do now to help you feel better? Yeah. Uh, purpose of this question is really to um, ask the person uh, what would be helpful at this point. Because a lot of times when we, we find out that, let's say, uh, we, or we suspect that someone uh, has an addiction in, in the family, then you go like, oh, I know you, you addicted, right? You, why don't you just do this, do this, you can't really, yeah. But that might not be what the person is actually looking for, yeah. So, in fact, I think the beginning would really be to um, help the person to feel uh, listened to and understood, yeah. Then I think slowly the, um, the, the work can then begin from there, yeah. Because the person is uh, more open and willing to accept uh, this this thing called addiction, yeah. Um, yeah. Second question would be, what would you like to work towards? How can we achieve it together? Uh, can we break it down into smaller steps? Um, for this question, uh, it's it's really more to help the person uh, feel less overwhelmed, not feel that oh, you know, this whole addiction is so big. Now you want me to suddenly just cut and and, and remove everything? No, I I can't. Yeah. So it's helping the person to. To know that okay, um, we, we could do it step by step. You're, you're not asking me to, to kind of totally remove it all together. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the 
uh, statement here we have would be, I know you don't agree with me and it makes you frustrated. Can we come to a middle ground? Um, this one, we, I mean, I, I cut this question in mind uh, when I thought of working with um, children and young persons. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of uh, maybe parents who are, who are here will know that it's so hard to communicate with teenagers. La. <laughs> Talk to them, they don't listen. Very real. Um, so I think, but here we want to give, um, give some sense of ownership back to the child or the young person uh, to say that, okay, this is not acceptable, but I'm not going to ask you to remove it totally now, but I need you to work with me like a young adult here. Yeah. So it also gives them the sense that, okay, uh, you know, they feel respected and then that might help them to uh, want to kind of listen to you a bit more instead of you going down very straight and saying, no, you have to listen to me and do this. Yeah, because that's going to just cause a rebound. Yeah. Um, last but not least, I'm here for you if you're ready to talk. Um, again, this one, I think we often hear a lot of questions from parents or, or in fact, anybody who works with children, young persons, or in fact, anyone that I want to talk about addiction, but wow, very angry, no? don't want to talk. Yeah. So, um, yes, we recognize that this is also very real. Um, hence, I think we also want to give the space. Of course, we're not saying that, you know, I'm here for you if I really talk, but then you don't come back ever again, no. Yeah, but it's giving the person some space. And again, um, it's the idea that you let the person feel respected that, okay, I, uh, you want me to talk to you, but okay, I, I, I can have some say in it. I can, some, uh, I can decide on it, like when I can talk, when I want to talk to you and stuff, yeah. Um, I think some other tips that probably you, you don't quite see here. Um, some, some have asked like, oh, you know, how do we even open the conversation? So I think we could also possibly use things like um, uh, use iMessages, like, you know, I noticed that you look very stressed lately, which is I talk about what's happening. Or the other way would be um, really, if, I think if some of us, some of y'all uh, have attended quite a few forums, I think y'all have heard this love language like, Quite a number of times, yeah. In fact, I think that one is <laughs> very useful, lah. Yeah. So, um, love language. I think it can be, uh, it can be doing something that um, the other person uh likes, um, uh, like maybe bringing the person the activity that he or she enjoys. I think that can be a good uh opener to kind of talk about some of these uncomfortable topics, uh, such as addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to run through uh some treatment methods that I've listed here. Um, so counseling, family therapy. I think counseling definitely uh it helps the person to um really examine what some of the beliefs or what some of the thinking thoughts that is leading to this addiction. Yeah. Um, if for example the the youth says, oh, I only feel good about myself if I can score the highest point, you know, in the online game, then. Oh, okay, then really is thinking, helping the young, the young person think about are there any other ways to uh, you know, feel good about themselves or feel more confident about themselves, yeah. Um, family therapy um, is important to, because I, I think as you all would have um, uh, heard it, right, we mentioned the family a lot of times. Um, why? Because then the family plays a very critical role in uh, helping to support the person. Uh, but um, Okay, the family therapy, of course, it then talks about maybe some of the issues that family is facing, such as communication and all that. Um, but it's also uh, helping to make sure that the other family members are not left out. Because a lot of times when the person, uh, someone, is addic someone in the family has addiction, all the attention will go to that person. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that everyone in the family is supported. So hence that is important. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, medication is listed here, but I think we want to uh, also mention this, that medication is more to, um, for instance, help the person curb the impulsivity, but it doesn't uh, take away the addiction, the behavior. Yeah. Mm. So this is the distinction we want to make here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think someone also had a question on um, for common behaviors like smoking. Uh, if the person doesn't really want to change, is there a way for the family to change the person? Um, I think uh, like what Ting Ting has mentioned in the last previous, sometimes uh, the love, the care and concern, and also um, the, the person who is addicted watching the uh, consequence may make a decision to change. Yeah, but however, if um, they kind of don't recognize the symptoms or feel that the need to change, it will be very, very hard uh, because that is their, a decision 
decision to change or take steps to address these changes often lies with the person who has the difficulties in the first place. So um, for the addict, right, uh, they kind of have to recognize the symptoms. Uh, how we ha can help as families is to be able to provide support to them, which I'll talk a bit later on. Uh, and also educating themselves if they are uh, they really want to change uh, their addictive behaviors, kind of understanding what causes it, what triggers it, what is uh, not functioning that's resulted them to use or to uh, engage in behavioral addictive uh, actions uh, and getting support from friends and families and like what they think say counseling. Um, but larger than that, I think a lot of your uh, concerned families and friends who are really worried about um, the, the, the person who is uh, addicted and also the experience that is very frustrating to keep on trying to change the person but the person don't want to change. Yeah, so um, kind of one of the important things is actually you must know what they are going through also. Yeah, what is the experience of addiction? Why it keeps them in that behavior as well? Uh, that high in the brain and uh, the rewards that they get. Um, of course, for parents, it might be helpful to set rules and boundaries, especially if you say an uh, internet addiction. For example, if uh, the, the, the computer is in the room, you might want to bring a computer into a place where it's more open so everyone, people can monitor him uh, or her uh, regularly. Uh, or uh, there could be a conversation to say, hey, actually, I'm really concerned about you and I know that it's very difficult to stop, but we really want to help you to stop and kind of like enjoy other parts of life uh, more wholly, etc. Or express your concern about why they are actually not function in other areas. So first of all, it's like what Tingting is saying, to listen, to be able to understand their point of view, to kind of open them up so that they will be more prepared to uh, listen to you as well. Um, and I think the important thing is don't enable, don't rescue them, especially if they are the uh, people who are uh, have problem gambling, uh, like we have mentioned. Let's say uh, if they lose money and you give them money, it will just uh, continue that high. I know we know it's very difficult. Uh, and as family and loved ones, it's not something that we want to see our families go down into to this path but the, the feeding them with uh, ways to continue their addiction can let them uh, can result in them continuing as well so um, what we have found out is that that's not helpful is lecturing nagging etc they, they really don't help um, but instead um, show that care understand the addiction understand their struggles um, and then slowing down the dosage so you cannot say like suddenly um, if they were playing five hours or eight hours a day you cannot suddenly say um, uh, tomorrow cannot play already because it's like the withdrawal symptoms will be very high. So maybe you can make an arrangement of how to kind of drop it over time. So maybe say, hey, next week we are going down to four hours. I mean, there will be resistance, but I think over time the care and concern, right, sometimes will outweigh the the, the resistance. Like like Mark Lee also had a situation where his family were the ones who caused him to result, to want to make the change. So um, I think the part is quite very important. Lah. Okay, so... Um, here are some of the uh, resources that we thought we will share with you. Mm. Uh, okay, so very quickly, these are some uh, support that we can suggest for caregivers, like for, for family members who are supporting someone with addiction. Uh, there are support groups out there um, that, you know, um, family members from, I mean, of course, from different families, like they can come down, uh, sit together and talk about their struggles, but also learning from one another what works in terms of helping the person with their addiction. Yeah. Uh, so family therapy, as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah. But I think one thing that unfortunately we have to mention is that relapse can take place. Um, so because the um, the whole cycle, I mean, it is a whole cycle in itself. So from uh, being addicted and then slowly moving towards recovery, uh, but relapse can happen. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that uh, you know the recovery is not possible. So but it just means that sometimes it can take quite a few rounds to really get the person. Uh, like uh, recovered from the addiction, yeah. Um, some some of the resources uh, that we mentioned here, NAMS, that's the National Addiction Management Service. Uh, that's under IMH. They do all all types of addiction, yeah. Um, and touch touch. Um, they do uh cyber wellness. They touch um their yeah. They they do talk a lot quite a bit about um, uh, managing uh, internet addiction for youths. Yeah. Uh, so we also want to uh, share that, right, uh, part of the recovery process when there's treatment is that actually relapse can happen. It's, it, relapse is actually part of the recovery. So um, it, it's not so easy to let go of a habit that somebody is very used to. Yeah, and so so I mean, imagine something that we really love. For example, I love coffee. It's actually very hard. It takes some time to cut it. Yeah, so understanding that relapse will happen is part of understanding the person who's addicted too. So as a family, we have to set quite realistic expectations also that 
that um, if, if, they, if we want them to stop, it cannot happen overnight. It must reduce in dosage and then maybe they will relapse again. Uh, it is a very difficult to bear with like what Vimy is saying. So uh, it, it really takes a lot for the family to grow together with the addict. And that's why we want to share that uh, what Ting Ting has shared, support groups are something that is actually very important. If you feel that you cannot tahan already, one of the important things is also to get support for yourself and take care of yourself. Don't give up on them, but then um, take care of yourself, do things that you need to do in your own life for your own functioning. Uh, so this thing is actually quite important. Then there are also other addictions resources, like we say, so let's say if you have somebody who is uh, addicted um, uh, that they uh, and you want to get into a family, families of people who are addicted, you can also go to, uh, you see, L non family groups, they do have um, support for families. Um, then for people who are addicts, for example, alcoholic, anonymous, etc., they do have uh, support groups as well. So these are the other resources that you may want to use. Um, of course, for other issues, like just now somebody say, hey, they're addicted or there's an attachment issue of to, to another person, for example, this person need to stick to you all the time. Uh, maybe this person has attachment difficulty or cannot manage on their own, but this is not really an addiction. So perhaps there could be other sources of help that you want to seek help for, right? Okay, uh, okay. so um, this is also another website that you might want to look into. Yeah, okay. Uh, and also uh, gambling support groups are also available in NEMS and WeCare. So just now we mentioned this thing uh, over here, WeCare Community Service, NEMS, they also provide uh, gambling support groups. Okay. okay, so uh, Priscilla, do we have questions that we haven't answered? Or oh, I think we have answered most of the questions, I think. Okay, so uh, there are a few questions. We try to answer most of the questions. Uh, and okay, so you missed the front part. Will there be a replay? Will there be a replay? Ting Ting, do you know? Uh, I think if I'm not wrong, it will be... Uh uploaded somewhere uh okay but i'm not too sure where uh okay on facebook oh thanks <laughs> thanks Tom, for answering our question yeah okay. you can upload on facebook so you could okay. uh, look at the replay there yeah sure okay and the second question is is anger withdrawal symptoms the boy gets very angry yeah, so this question we have already answered. So basically one of the ways to do it is actually to reduce it slowly and understand that relapse is part of the, 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 the recovery part. Lah. So they try, then encourage them when they are trying. And also um, to give encouragement, show care, listen to their struggles. Actually, this is actually something that's very important for them to uh, be able to move away from the addiction. Yeah, uh, yeah so... Uh, Will the boy grow out of the habit when he grows older? Um, so it, it really depends. Ting Ting, you want to answer this question? Um, I think it really, uh, first thing would be really, uh, yes, every child plays definitely. And I think we forgot to say something just now that, um, in fact, we, we can't quite totally um, get the children and young persons, I mean, in this instance, to totally just cut away the internet access. Because why? Um, their school staff is all online now. <laughs> And all the teachers are using WhatsApp to uh, interact with the with the students, yeah. So it's not as simple as oh no, you stop using, yeah. Um, and yeah, because then um every child plays. So we are really looking at uh you know just now the four um the symptoms that we talk about, right? So whether it affects functioning, uh, whether um it affects their relationships, their you know yeah, whether they they can do what they're supposed to be doing, yeah. So if let's say they they still can fulfill, you know, going to school, they still mix around with friends and all that. So it's really maybe helping them to look at how to manage their time a little bit better. It's not really so much addiction. Yeah. Mm. Mm, yes. And I think if you are saying when he grows older, um, this one, we can't quite say for mm. sure. I mean, to be honest, yeah. uh, because it really depends on when they go into that different phase of development, uh, maybe in adolescence, then some other things might take place, um, some things might become more important for them, and then they slowly reduce the usage of the phone and the, and the gaming. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot I of things could yeah. happen, yeah. It is, a, it is a hard question to answer because it depends on uh, how many hours he plays a day. <clears throat> and whether the, there's excessive use. <clears throat> so, for children who are not doing excessive um, uh, internet gaming, it may not be so, they, they may over time, like, you know, there are some situations where a new game comes about. <coughs> so they spend more time actually uh, playing the game. And after that, they're not interested already, they will stop. But for those who play excessively, maybe 60 to 80, maybe need to consider how to get help. Uh, sorry, the last question is, what is the usual need for addicts other than to get high and enjoy themselves? Um, 
this one, uh, okay, I think uh, self go here, uh, you can come next week, <laughs> the answer will be there. Yeah, but no, but I think uh, anyway, the, the thing is that um, the reason, uh, that can, there can be a lot of reasons. Uh, it really depends on what is the need that the person is trying to uh, meet here. So it can be um, maybe really just uh, a form of uh, coping mechanism, uh, or it could be um, maybe wanting to continue to belong to the peer group, um yeah but i think then again the next question would be um what what does this peer group provide for the person that the person cannot get elsewhere yeah even have even resorting to addiction just to get uh just to continue to be in the group yeah mm, so i mean I, I think there are a lot of uh factors that that could make a person addicted to drugs yeah mm -hmm. Okay, so we have been come to the end of the session. So uh, here on the screen is actually the QR code. And also uh, the chat moderator has also indicated the uh, link. If you could provide us with the feedback, we'll be very grateful. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, yeah, and have a very good evening as well. <laughs>